Thank you, worship team. Amen. Uh, I say this every week, but if you have the church app, you can open it up now. And the first thing that you'll see on the home screen is the sermon notes to follow along as I'm preaching. Uh, I know for some of you, you've thought, yeah, I haven't really got the app yet. Take the time now. Take a couple seconds. Go to the App Store or the Google Play Store. Type in Palmdale UMC and download the app and follow along with us. Let us pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. According to the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary, the definition for delight is a high degree of satisfaction or pleasure, joy, or it's something that gives great pleasure. So, what gives you delight? There's a number of things I could list. Uh, visiting Disneyland would have been at the top of my list, uh, or it was pre-COVID. When my daughter Emily was in preschool, the, she finger painted this picture, and she titled the picture, My Heart is Beeping, B-E-E-P-I-N-G. So whenever I make the two-hour drive from Palmdale down to Anaheim, and whenever the Matterhorn comes into my sight, I always say out loud or to whoever's driving with me, my heart is beeping. <sighs> also, being up in the mountains with rocks and rivers, trees and creatures, that gives me delight. It could be that my father was a National Park Service ranger, so from a young age I had a deep appreciation for the beauty and splendor of God's natural creation. If you ask my wife Jody, uh, what is her delight? Uh, she would immediately respond with quilting. Her happy place is to spend an afternoon or the entire day sitting at her sewing machine creating some kind of amazing quilted masterpiece. That fills her up and brings her joy. It truly is her delight. So what is it that, what is it that brings you delight? In fact, if you're worshiping with someone else this morning, I invite you to take a couple seconds and just off the top of your head, share one to two things that bring you delight. Go ahead, do that now. I'll wait. Make sure everyone has a chance to share. There's a number of variations of the if you were standed on a, stranded on a desert island game that folks like to play, right? Like, but what's one item that, that you would bring with you in order to survive? Or what's, who is one person that you would want to take with you? Or what, uh, what one skill set would you like to have at your disposal? Like uh, foraging for food, uh, cr uh, constructing a shelter, knowing how to spell S-O-S in rocks on the beach, whatever it may be, right? But since this sermon series has been dealing with the wonderful subject of food, I have to ask you, <clears throat> if you were stranded on a desert island and you could only choose one food to eat every day, all day long, and we'll just say refrigeration uh, was not a problem, what would you choose on a desert island? Now, if you ask an elementary school child, you might get the answer of, Pizza, hamburgers, chicken nuggets, macaroni and cheese, but what would you pick? Would it be a fruit or a vegetable? Maybe something containing protein like meat or cheese? Personally, I'd be very tempted to select double stuff Oreo cookies, although I don't think that may be the best long-term uh, choice. A few years ago, the website healthline.com ran an article entitled, here are the six most popular dinner, dinner combos in the United States. Written by Kelly Eglon, the article chronicled the study that Healthline conducted with the help of LifeSum, a digital health company with 30 million users. They focused on the most popular dinners around the United States, and they broke each meal down into three parts, carbs, protein, and veggies. Now, how each of these particular items were prepared, that would vary quite a bit by region, but here are the top six combinations that they found. And of course, folks could add additional items in preparing these uh, basic ingredients to their meal. Here's the top three part connections. Number one, rice, chicken, and salad. 
Now again, how you prepare it makes a difference in how healthy it is, uh, from southern fried chicken uh, to grilling it with salt and pepper. But these three basics are classically American, right? Rice, chicken, and greens. And note, you can see from the map here which areas of the country have this as one of their main selections. Those states that are a bit darker pink uh, are the ones that, that have this more than the rest. Number two, potato, cheese, and beans. Now this could be the beginning of a hearty casserole or a breakfast burrito, depending on how you prepare it. But these are definite foods that many Americans consume regularly. Again, looking at the map, seeing which part of the country this is popular in. Number three, bread, egg, and bell peppers. Now you know what they say, right? Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, so this combination surely delivers on that promise. Now the types of bread that you choose and how you prepare your eggs varies, but kudos to peppers for adding a bit of color uh, to this otherwise bland combination. Number four, fries, beef, and tomatoes. Now this is for all you meat and potatoes folks out there. This, the cut of beef will vary, of course, as well as how it's prepared. And for some, the tomato comes in the form of ketchup, right? But hey, to each his own. Number five, quinoa, turkey, and broccoli. As you can tell by the map, this high fiber combination is quite popular all across the country. In fact, quinoa is fast becoming the grain of choice for those looking for a more healthy option. And turkey is even lower in calories and higher in protein than chicken. And then finally, number six, couscous, pork, and spinach. Pork garnered the reputation as the other white meat in the late 80s, but there's a number of ways to prepare this beloved protein, including a number of sauces that different parts of the country slather it in. Adding couscous and spinach rounds out this very healthy combination. Well, we're five weeks, friends, into our series on tasting grace, discovering the power of food to connect us to God, one another, and to ourselves. It's a series that's based off of Melissa D. Arabian's book of the same title. And if you're new to the series, Melissa is a United Methodist from San Diego. She's part of St. Paul's UMC in Coronado. And Melissa is working with seven other United Methodist churches across our annual conference as we go through this series together. Chapter 12 of her book is titled, Taking Pleasure in God's Food, an Invitation into Delight. Melissa begins by stating that God not only created us, but God also created the food to feed us. In Genesis 1, 29, she says, or God says, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with its seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. This verse is a vegetarian's delight, right? But don't worry, meat lovers, God adds that option later on in chapter 9. But God has indeed provided a plethora of plants, vegetables, and fruit for our enjoyment. The problem comes, however, when we abuse this good gift from God. And when we eat, as Melissa puts it, in ways that God never intended. Consuming large quantities of salt, fat, and sugar, we have, by and large, become a population with numerous health problems. Our diet often leads us to getting sick, and then we feel guilty about our eating habits, which then drives an entire culture of guilt-driven language, not to mention various behaviors of punishment and rewards all around what should be just a wonderful gift of food. Melissa writes, God made the world much yummier than he needed to. If God intended for food to be purely fuel, he would not have made peaches so tasty. He would have easily created a more efficient, less delicious system of nourishment than what we have. In fact, he could have skipped the notion of taste altogether. Instead, he gave us sweet plums and grassy asparagus, tangy olives, luscious figs, creamy avocados, and silky sweet honey. He gave us sweet and salty and fatty things, each one with its unique function. Isn't that a wonderful way of looking at food? It's so amazing how God has blessed us with delicious foods and the capacity to not only enjoy them thoroughly, but to take delight in them as well. The Bible has 
many clues that tell us that God loves a good meal. Right? In Genesis, we read one of the very first things that God did for humanity was to set up this food system to nourish us and take care of us. In Exodus, when God fed the Israelites with free bed, bread that fell from the sky, known as manna, he made it taste sweet like honey. Throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus spent much of his ministry eating, and, and many times when he shared the Gospel, he performed or performed a miracle. Jesus was either eating, sharing a meal, going to a meal, or coming from one. And in Revelation, when the scriptures talk about God's final kingdom, it's depicted as a huge feast. Again, Melissa writes, Food is indeed a gift from God, and we can delight in it with gratitude and joy. The culture of guilt around food, pleasure, being good about what we're eating, earning dessert by eating healthy first, or, or working off a special treat, that's a human idea. It's not God's. The guilt comes from our human tampering with God's system and using food in ways that God did not intend. Melissa cites her own journey with fake sweeteners, fake fats, and quick fix crazy diets that have gotten in the way of how she believes God wants us to live and to eat. That God gave us deliciousness because God loves us and God wants to invite us into delight. God created us and the food that our bodies need. So let us find ways to be present while we eat, to take delight in what nourishes us. Every meal is a chance to draw closer to God. What wonderful advice. Now, normally we save uh, Melissa's RSVP invitation uh, to the very end of the message, but I thought it would be uh, important to hear from her right now. So let's listen to what she says about the RSVP into delight. God could have made a food system where nothing tasted good. And in fact, God could have created a really efficient system where we didn't even need to eat food. But instead, God created a food system that was delicious. God gave us a delicious world. Why? Well, society says that when we eat something delicious, we've got to feel guilty about it or we've got to work it off in the gym. Society tells us that tomatoes have too much sugar or that creamy avocados have too much fat. Society tells us to have guilt language around the foods that we eat. But what does God say? God says that food is a wonderful gift and that he wants us to enjoy his foods. God tells us that we can trust his system of satisfying our palates with the foods that he has created for us. We can enjoy that juicy peach, that wonderful sweet orange. We don't have to short circuit his system by creating an artificial sweetener that gives us all the sweetness but none of the calories we can lean into the food system that God created to satisfy our palates. So how can we RSVP into this invitation into delight? Well, one, think back to a gift that you bought somebody. You know, maybe it was like this really amazing Christmas gift that you got your spouse or your child or a friend. Maybe it's a birthday gift that you couldn't wait to give somebody. Now think about how much joy you had and anticipation you had in giving that gift to that person and them opening it, right? Now imagine they open up that gift and then they're like disappointed or like, oh, I can't eat it. I can't have, I can't have that sugary tomato, right? What happens when we give someone a gift? We want them to enjoy it, don't we? So lean into the joy of knowing that God has given us a delicious world so that we may delight in it. The second way to RSVP into this invitation is to think about the language you use around food. Do you use language like, oh, I'm being good today by not having dessert, or oh, I'm being so bad, I'm having X, Y, Z. Maybe just being aware of our language around food and how we talk about it will open us up 
to receiving the amazing gift that God is giving us with food and the delight that is intended to go with it. I couldn't just end the sermon there. The more I thought about her words, that every meal is a chance to draw closer to God, my spirit was drawn to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and addressing a number of unfortunate divisions that had become part of their community of faith. In chapter 11, Paul hints, uh, hits on the subject of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, Holy Communion. And beginning with verse 27, Paul writes this. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. Sounds so ominous, doesn't it? Eh, have others heard this passage before? It's often, I believe, misunderstood to mean that only the truly righteous and holy can participate in the Lord's Supper. And then, only after intense introspection to make sure that one is 100% in good standing with the Lord God Almighty, is it okay to partake? As Richard B. Hayes says in his interpretation commentary on 1 Corinthians, that, however, is a grave misreading, which made me say grave misreading. Oh, do tell. You could say that the church in Corinth was partaking in the Lord's Supper in a way that God never intended. Not only was it not bringing delight to the community, but more importantly, it was no longer a means by which they could draw closer to God. So let's dive into this specific, shall we? To begin with, Paul's experience of the Lord's Supper in the first century is a bit different from how we experience it today. Robert Scott Nash, in his Smith and Helwey's commentary on 1 and 2 Corinthians, notes that the earliest practices of the church seems to have been to observe the Lord's Supper in the context of a meal. It wasn't a liturgical ritual that celebrated in a church building. No, it was an actual meal eaten by the community in a private home. It was also a full meal, possibly modeled after the Jewish Passover meal, not just bread and wine or grape juice as we have today. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. Now, this wasn't about sacramental the theology at all, right? But this is more of a problem of social relations within the Corinthian church. Now, here's some insight into the context of what was taking place during this period. Archaeological study of Roman homes from this period have shown that the dining room or the triclinium of a, a typical uh, villa could accommodate about nine persons. And they would uh, gather around and recline at a table for a meal. They wouldn't sit in chairs. They would recline on the ground. Other guests would have to stay in the atrium. Now, upon entering a Roman villa, the open-air atrium was the first place a visitor would arrive at it. It usually had a pool in the center to catch rainwater that drained off of the roof. Uh, around the sides, and depending on the size, maybe 30 or 40 guests could stand or sit in the atrium. In such a setting, the social rank of guests would be quite noticeable, since in all probability, those guests who reclined with the host in the triclinium, they would have been persons of the most rank. Richard Hayes comments that freedmen and slaves in the Corinthian community would most likely have been the ones to gather in the atrium. Furthermore, it wasn't at all unusual for the higher status guests in the dining room to be served better food and wine than the other guests. Uh, think of it like how first class passengers on an airliner receive much better food and service than those of us who normally ride in coach. Well, back to our text from 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul says, for when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, he's not talking about some folks eating early before the others arrive. Robert Scott Nash talks about the Roman subscription dinner known as Eranos, 
which involved guests either paying their share for the food or bringing their own food. So in the Corinthian context, each church member would have brought food that ideally would have then become communal property. Think of it as the original church potluck, right? The problem is, as Paul, Paul saw it, is that the people were bringing food and then they were eating whatever food they brought themselves without sharing it with others. So persons of means were eating everything that they brought, while those of lesser means had more meager fare, if anything, to eat. What was supposed to have been a communal meal, signifying the oneness of the community of faith, instead became another occasion for simply highlighting the differences between the social strata. On top of that, researchers have discovered that Corinth was affected by grain shortages during and after Paul's time with that community. And so it's understandable that the, that hard time would have fallen even more severely on the poorer members of the church. Their inability to bring adequate food for themselves for the Lord's Supper would have exacerbated the inequality between them and the wealthier members. Paul is telling the Christians in Corinth that some of them are treating the Lord's Supper as if it were a meal simply for their own enjoyment and nutrition. No, Paul says, it's a meal that's supposed to proclaim Christ's death to all. Verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus' entire life, ministry, and death was spent living for others. The meal that he shared with the disciples, the, the meal that the Christian community across the Mediterranean was observing, that was supposed to remind people of this very fact of Jesus' selflessness. It's about giving ourselves away to others in love. Some in the Corinth church forgot that. And in effect, they nullified everything that Jesus was about. It's not supposed to be about us versus them. It's, it, it's not supposed to be about the economic divisions. It's supposed to be about love and inclusivity and true delight. Dr. Heather Murray Elkins was one of my favorite professors at Drew Theological School in Madison, New Jersey. In her book, The Holy Stuff of Life, Heather tells the fascinating story of what she titles it as the life of a spoon. Her father brought home a silver spoon from the Korean War. He never told her why he brought it home with him, but he did show them a picture of two children, two Korean children, a girl of seven and her brother who was a little bit younger. He was in the Army Corps of Engineers, and their job was to build roads for retreating officers and equipment in South Korea. The children found him at a stream while he was shaving. They were dirty and starving. He offered the girl a part of his rations, a comb, a piece of soap. She came back with her brother in tow, washed, combed, and smiling. He let them stay, he fed them, taught them a little English, learned a little Korean. He even wrote home about possibly adopting them, but when his unit had to retreat, he was forced to leave them behind. And so he paid for a family to feed them. He lost the children. But he kept the story, the photo, and the spoon. Heather had the opportunity to travel to Korea to establish a faculty exchange program between Drew and Awa Women's University in Seoul. Awa's first president, Alice Appenzeller, was the daughter of Henry Appenzeller, the first Methodist missionary to Korea and also a Drew graduate. Heather traveled to Korea to teach uh, liturgical theology at Awa. Two weeks after she arrived, on September 11th, 2001, the world as we know it exploded. All systems of communication, phone, email, airlines, they all go down. Two weeks later, the phones work again, and she gets a call from her husband, Bill. He's coming to Korea as soon as the airport's open, and he's bringing her father. They arrive 51 years after his, her father had last set foot on Korean soil. It also happens to be the day that the U.S. declares war on terrorism by bombing Afghanistan. She asks her 83-year-old father, whose health is failing, why he came. He simply says he wanted to see a people 
who'd been to hell and back again before he dies. So they took him to see bridges and roads and city streets. They go to see the Monument of Peace that overlooks uh, the demilitarized zone, a place where uh, a war, a half a century, is still being waged. And she finally asks him about the spoon. He simply says, it's the weapon of a Christian. His answer explodes her hardline assumptions about why her father wears a veteran cap that says Korea and what sense he's made of his life as an Appalachian man faithfully serving his country in two world wars. A spoon is the weapon of a Christian. Later that fall, Heather packs the spoon as she prepares to lead a Thanksgiving service at a small Methodist church by the Eastern Sea. When she arrives, the words, give thanks, are written in Korean and placed on a wall above the preacher's chairs. She's decided it's going to be a service of spoons. In fact, she asked the pastor to invite all of the members of the congregation to bring their spoons when they come to church that Sunday. Now, you may not know this, but Koreans have a lifelong relationship with their spoons. If it's given uh, to a child, of course, it's very small in size. But as the child grows, the mother then takes the spoon to a metal worker and has the spoon handle extended so that the spoon grows along with the child. Korean spoons are more intimately connected to a person's life than most of us in North America ever experience. Needless to say, the congregation was quite curious as to why they had to bring their spoons to church. During the message, Heather invites them to remember that they have been spoon-fed by God and by those who love them. She asks them to consider what it means when Jesus tells us, feed my lambs. There's children and elders starving less than 20 miles away from that very church where she was preaching, across the DMZ in North Korea, separated by barbed wire and half a century of war. Heather recalls the story of her own grandmother, who at the age of 106 moved from feeding others to being fed. And it was Heather's job to feed grandmother. Long after other tastes have departed, the sense of bitter and sweet remains, so grandma chooses to eat dessert first. Heather spoon-fed her ice cream, but her attention was elsewhere, and that's when grandma stopped the spoon. Being blind, she traced the spoon to Heather's fingers, and then she kissed the hand. Heather writes, it's a simple gesture of gratitude and profound sacramental insight. To kiss the hand that feeds you, hmm, that's Eucharist. Thanksgiving to feed others as you have been fed is Eucharist. Thankful giving. Heather then shows them her father's spoon. She tells its story and the power that it holds and finishes by saying, the spoon is the weapon of a Christian. When she looks at the faces of her congregation, she knows that they know what it means. Many had family on the other side whom they hadn't seen in almost 50 years. Members that the congregation uh, members of the congregation voluntarily work to maintain a road in their village that no one has be been permitted to travel on for half a century, praying that one day that road will become a highway of peace. In a last-minute decision, Heather asks for a basket so that they can bring their spoons forward and offer them up in prayer. She invites them to place their spoons in the basket as a sign that that they're willing to use their spoons to work for peace. She challenges them to feed the lambs as Jesus asked, regardless of which side of the line they're on. She calls them to bring their spoons to Christ's table as a sign that they're willing to do the unthinkable, to share a table with their enemies. And one by one they come, each of them dropping their spoon in the basket. In fact, one mother places her baby's bottle alongside her own spoon. She tells the pastor she wants her child to be fed with the gospel. Heather prays, the pastor prays, or at least starts to pray, and then breaks down, 
fighting the tears, trying to finish. There was this long, unnatural silence, and Heather said she began to hear an odd rattling sound. And she looks up, she sees that the pastor is holding the basket above his head, and his hands are trembling. And she's hearing the sound of spoons rattling together. And when he finishes the prayer and places the basket back on the altar, he tells the church he's had a vision. A vision of spoons. When he lifted the basket, he heard a voice in his head say, there are only 141 spoons here. Where are the other 2,000? Later, Heather asked, the pastor, what he thought the vision meant, he said he didn't know. But that as a church, they would pray until they found the answer. And they would start working with their spoons. Whew. My brothers and sisters of faith, on this World Communion Sunday, may each of us recognize down to the very core of our being that the spoon is indeed the weapon of a Christian. May we take delight every time we use our spoons to savor the deliciousness of the food that God has given us in this world, yes, but also when we use it to feed others, that we may embody what it means to be the body of Christ, broken for the world. May we not fall into the trap like those early Corinthian Christians where the sacrament of Holy Communion becomes just another opportunity to eat in church. May we recognize the power that comes from the life and death of Jesus. May we know the truth that his death was for all people, friend or foe. And may we rediscover the delight that comes from gathering around this holy table whether it's in person or across the digital divide. The spoon is the weapon of a Christian. Amen.